नमस्ते वेलकम बैक टू सुप्रज्ञा एंड यू आर वाचिंग ए डब्ल्यू एस सर्टिफाइड सोल्यूशन आर्किटेक्ट असोसिएट एग्जाम क्वेश्चन एनालिसिस सीरीज एंड दिस दि इन दिस वीडियो वी आर गोइंग टू कवर क्वेश्चन दैट वेर आस्ट इन द मंथ ऑफ फेब्रवरी ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी फोर राइट दैट बींग सेट इफ यू हैव इन सब्सक्राइब्स टू दिस चैनल गो एड एंड डू दैट दिस इज एन राइट मूवमेंट for you to do it because i just finished recording the almost 100 projects real time projects videos and you can find them in the playlist two playlists 1 to 24 projects are available in aws cloud quest and 25 to almost 98 i guess are available in a playlist called aws cloud projects for beginner to expert um the links are available i mean it will pop up right here one of them the other one will be available at the end if not you can check the description of this video all the playlist links are provided in the description so don't worry about it and not just that i am working on the devops professional sysops professional sysops and then also you you already saw i uploaded one video for data engineer the new certification which will be available from uh, this month 12th and one more what was it i'm missing the solutions architect professional so if you don't want to miss the updates or if you don't want to miss you know whenever i post these videos go ahead subscribe and if you want to support this channel so that i can make more amazing content you can even support by becoming a member as part of membership you will get pdf files and depends on the type of membership you might get one pdf two pdfs are unlimited number of pdfs uh, you can check that in the memberships option but that being said thank you very much if you already subscribed if you haven't again do that and don't forget to hit the like and comment and also enable the notifications awesome so let's finish this and all the best a company has established a new aws account the account is newly provisioned and no changes has been made to the default settings The company is concerned about the security of the AWS root user. Of course, you are supposed to be concerned about the root user. What should be done to secure the root user? We have seen this question in our 760, or maybe not 760 because we didn't record some of the questions. Uh, maybe let's say 500 questions. Uh, we have seen this root user question all repeatedly asked in SSA, SAAA, SAA, and CLF as well. so you should have already know the answer what is that this is okay as usual i am going to go the, through the wrong answers first and then the right answer and if you are new i will go through all the four options and i will explain why a particular option is not right or why an option is right the reason i do that is an option might be wrong for this question but it might be right for some other question so when you watch one question which is kind of equal to you watching four different questions okay so let's look at option a create iam users for daily administrative tasks then disable the root user okay disabling the root user is a good practice but it's important to have it enabled with mfa for emergency access because there are certain type of tasks only a root user can do it so if you disable the root user how are you going to do that you cannot so for that reason complete disabling might cause issues in case of account recovery hence that's not the right option let's look at option c generate an access key for root user use the access key for daily administration task instead of aws management console using access keys for the root user in day to day task is not recommended due to security risk associated with long term static credentials hence this is a gone and option d sharing root user credentials as this is talking about is not recommended as it increases the risk of unauthorized access and hinders accountability individual iam users with appropriate permissions are a better practice okay so you don't provide the credentials to most senior solutions architect so then we are left with option b 
create IAM users for daily administrative tasks and enable MFA on the root account user. That is the best practice and most secured way. Why? Because creating different IAM users allows you to create um, these users with specific permissions and you can use these users for daily tasks which allows you to grant the least privilege necessary reducing the risk of accidental or intentional misuse. And why do we need MFA? It adds an extra layer of security to the root user account. Even if the root user credentials are compromised, an additional authentication factor is required to access the account. Awesome. A company is deploying an application that processes streaming data in near real time. The company plans to use Amazon EC2 instances for the workload. The network architecture must be configurable to provide the lowest possible latency between nodes. Which combination of network solutions will meet these requirements? All right, let's go through the options. Group the EC2 instances in separate accounts. Well, grouping instances in separate accounts doesn't necessarily contribute to low latency networking. It's more related to organizational and access control considerations, right? Separate accounts, nothing to do with low latency or latency in general. Attach multiple elastic network interfaces to each EC2 instance. Well, while multiple network interfaces can be useful for specific use cases, it's not a primary solution for achieving the lowest latency. Enhanced networking and placement groups are more relevant for latency reduction. That is what they are trying to test here. And then we have option E. Use EBS optimized instance types. EBS optimization is more related to storage performance rather than network latency. It may improve disk I.O. but it won't directly address the network. Sorry, need for low latency networking between EC2 instances. So whenever they ask you a question about low latency between EC2 instances, you, may, you should be thinking about placement groups, which is what option C is talking about. Run these in cluster placement group. Okay, What is a cluster placement group? It is a logical grouping of instances within a single availability zone. It is designed to provide low latency communication between instances. This can be particularly beneficial for applications that require high network performance, such as what the one one asked in the question. And enable and configure enhanced networking on each EC2 instance. Enhanced networking provides higher performance by offloading some of the networking processing to the underlying hardware. This can help reduce latency. A financial services company wants to shut down two data centers and migrate more than 100 TB of data to AWS. The data has an intricate directory structure with millions of small files stored in deep hierarchies of subfolders. Most of the data is unstructured and the company's file storage consists of SMB based storage types from multiple vendors. The company does not want to change its applications to access the data after migration. They don't want to change. What, solution, what should a solutions architect do to meet these requirements with the least operational overhead? What is the tip I gave you when they ask least operational overhead? They are trying to ask one thing. If they mention as AWS services, in the question, then they are asking a future feature of that service. If they didn't mention any, then they are talking about a service specifically designed by AWS as a solution. Okay, so let's go through the answer. Use direct connect to migrate the data to S3. That is a big no because direct connect provides a dedicated network connection to AWS which can be useful for transferring data with consistent and predictable performance. However, migrating data directly to S3 may not be the most seamless solution for a scenario where the data consists of SMB based storage types. It could require additional steps to ensure compatibility with existing applications that use SMB based storage. And 
let's look at D as well because it is <clears throat> trying to use direct connect to migrate the data on premises file storage to an AWS storage gateway volume gateway. <clears throat> okay, now let's look at this one. Here they added additionally storage gateway. What is storage gateway? It is a hybrid cloud storage service that enables on premises applications to use cloud storage. In this scenario, direct connect to migrate data to storage gateway, volume gateway might introduce additional complexities and configurations. It may not be the most straightforward solution for a scenario where the goal is to minimize operational overhead. Let's take a look at options B and C. Both are using data sync and we already know data sync is used to efficiently migrate data between on-premise and your <coughs> AWS cloud, but which one do we go with? Luster or Windows Fire Server? So the SMB based storage actually gives away the answer, which is the Windows File Server because Luster doesn't support SMB. If I open this particular URL, you will see that um, Luster is at the end and Windows File Server is here and the other two are here. You can see that, right? So if I go and see this protocol supported, the first one, which is the NetApp that supports all pretty much and this one was open ZFS only NFS and this is the luster sorry FSX for Windows file server and if you look at this only Linux SMB is for the Windows but as you can see this one doesn't support it hence our answer is C not B a company uses an organization in AWS organizations to manage AWS accounts that contain applications. The company sets up a dedicated monitoring member account in the organization. The company wants to query and visualize observability data across the accounts by using CloudWatch. Which solution will meet these requirements? Option B, set up SCP service control protocol policies to provide access to CloudWatch in the monitoring account under the organization's root organizational unit. SCPs are used to for what? To set fine-grained permissions for member accounts within an organization. This option suggests setting up SCPs to provide access to cloud watch in the monitoring account while scps are useful for control they are more about permission control and may not directly provide the data sharing mechan mechanism for observability option c this option involves creating a new iam user in the monitoring account and iam policies in each aws account to allow access to CloudWatch data. While this can work, it may require more manual configuration and maintenance compared to other options because you are going to create new user in the um, in each account you are going to configure it. And then we have option D. Similar to option C, this suggests creating a new IAM user in the monitoring account and cross account IAM policies in each AWS account. It involves more manual configuration and might be less scalable option. So we are going to go with option A. Why option A? Because this involves enabling CloudWatch cross-account observability. That is a feature. That is what the question is trying to ask you, which allows the monitoring account to access data from other accounts. Deploying an AWS cloud formation template in each AWS account facilitates the sharing of observability data. This approach can work effectively for centralizing monitoring across multiple accounts. A company's website is used to sell products to the public. The site runs on Amazon EC2 instances in an auto-scaling group behind an application load balancer. There is, an, there is also an Amazon cloud front distribution and AWS WAF web application firewall is being used to protect against SQL injections attacks. The ALB is the origin for the CloudFront distribution. 
a recent review of security logs revealed an external malicious IP that needs to be blocked from accessing the website. What solution a solutions what should a solutions architect do to protect the application? Uh, if you don't know what we are talking here, we have done a project which uses which does the exact same thing. And where is this project? As I mentioned in the beginning of the video, these projects are available in two playlists, uh, which are AWS Cloud Quest and another one is AWS Cloud Projects for Beta to Expert. Go check those projects. Most of these question scenarios are actually done in those projects. Let's look at the options. Option A, it's talking about modifying network ACL on cloud front distribution to add a deny rule for the malicious IP address. NACLs are more related to controlling access to cloud front based on IP addresses, but they might not be as effective for blocking specific malicious IPs, IPs. And option C is talking about modifying network ACL for EC2 instances in target groups behind the ALB to deny the malicious IP address. Similar to option A, network ACLs at the EC2 instance level might not be the most effective way to block malicious IP at the application layer. So hence, that's a goner. And option D, modify the security groups for EC2 instances in the target groups, similar to C. But here we are going to use security groups. While security groups control inbound and outbound traffic to EC2 instances, they are not the ideal tool for blocking at the application layer because we are blocking it at the, we want to block it at the application layer, right? So if you want to do that at the application layer, what do you use? You modify the configuration of web application firewall to add an IP match condition to block the malicious IP addresses. WAF is designed to protect web applications from various attacks, including SQL injections. They are already they mentioned. Since WAF is already being used in this scenario, modifying its configurations to add an IP match condition is a suitable approach. You can add so many roles if you watch watch go watch the projects. We have done different kinds of uh, rules in the WAF, wherein we I think we even added an IP match condition as well. We, are, we did SQL injection attacks and we also did cross-site scripting. There are so many rules present in WAF. Go check them out. Go check the project. You will understand what I am talking about. And modifying WAF to add an IP match condition allows you to specify rules for blocking or allowing requests based on IP addresses. This way you can block the identified malicious IP address from accessing the website. A company sets up an organization in AWS organizations that contains 10 AWS accounts. A solutions architect must design a solution to provide access to the accounts for several thousand employees. The company has an existing IDP. The company wants to use the existing IDP for authentication to AWS. Which solution will meet these requirements? I mean, this is a easy giveaway. If you ask me, right, whenever you have IDP and if you want to integrate that with AWS, what should come to your mind? SSO, which is renamed to IAM Identity Center. Let's look at other options as well. Option A. Create IAM users for employees in the required AWS accounts. Connect IAM users to the existing IDP. Configure federated authentication for IAM users. While federated authentication is a good practice, manually creating IAM users for several thousand employees in each account can be cumbersome and may not scale well. Hence, cross this out. Option B, set up AWS account root users with user email addresses and password that are synchronized from the existing IP. Same thing kind of using account root users for employee access is not recommended due to security concerns. Root users have broad permissions and should be used sparingly. So this is a goner. And option D, use resource access manager to share access to accounts. 
if you don't know what ram is it is designed for resource sharing across accounts but it doesn't handle authentication and user provisioning it is not the appropriate tool for providing access to several thousand employees with an existing idp so when you have the scenario what do you do you will use an sso or iam identity center this is a fully managed service that allows users to access multiple aws accounts and applications using their existing corporate credentials it simplifies the user access management across aws accounts and this can be configured to connect to existing identity provider allowing users to sign in using their existing corporate credentials this leverages the existing authentication mechanism and provision users and groups this the identity center allows you to also provision users and groups from the existing idp this eliminates the need to manually recreate iam users in each aws account a solutions architect is designing an aws identity and access management authorization model for a company's aws account the company has designated five specific employees to have full access to aws services and resources in the aws account the solutions architect has created an iam user for each of the five designated employees and has created an iam user group which solution will meet these requirements and if you see the options are divided into two administrative access and a system administrator resource based identity based okay so in both administrative system you have resources and identity so let's go ahead and try to choose the answers uh, try to choose the correct answer the first one this is talking about attach the administrator access resource based policy to the iam user group place each of the five designated employee iam users in the user group if you don't know resource based policies are used for defining permissions on resources such as s3 buckets or lambda functions not for iam user groups and the administrator access policy is an identity based policy okay so for that reason you can cross this out and the resource based policy we have already discussed about it just now it is done for the resources not for user group so you can immediately eliminate this one as well one bird sorry what is what is this thing uh, one stone two birds okay that eliminated a and d now between b and c which one will you go with will you go with system administrator or administrator access so let's go and check the system administrator this policy system administrator policy is not a standard aws policy using a policy that is not well documented or recognized might lead to unexpected behavior so if you go check it this is not an aws standard policy so cross that out which will take us to option c which is use administrator access and administrator access policy is a managed policy in aws iam that grants full access to aws services and resources it is designed to provide unrestricted access to perform any action in aws account and identity based policies as we discussed are attached directly to iam users groups or roles in this case attaching the administrator access policy directly to iam user group ensures that all users within that group inherit the permissions and then we have iam user group if you don't know what that is creating a group allows for easy management of permissions by placing each of the five designated employee iam users in the iam user group you can efficiently manage and grant full access to the specified resources a company has a multi-tiered payment processing application that is based on virtual machines the communication between the tiers occurs asynchronously through a third party middleware solution that guarantees exactly one de once delivery the company needs a solution that requires the least amount of infrastructure management we already know what this means either they are talking about a serverless service or fully managed 
the solution must guarantee exactly once delivery for application messaging. I think they are easily giving away a couple of answers right here. So let's go through the options. Use EC2 instances for the compute layer. Whenever there's a least amount of infrastructure, immediately elim eliminate anything that says EC2 because it is it is uh, not a fully managed or serverless. So eliminate that anything that says EC2. Option C says use the SNS as the messaging component between compute layers. Well, SNS is a messaging service. You might think, oh, they're talking about messaging. Why not use this? But this is more suitable for pub sub scenarios rather than asynchronous communication with guaranteed exactly once delivery. SNS doesn't inherently provide first in first out semantics. It does do that, but along with some other tool, which we will talk about in a minute. Option E talks about using containers that are based on EKS for the compute layers in the architecture. While containers and EKS offer benefits such as container orchestration, they still involve more management compared to serverless options. Achieving exactly once delivery might require additional efforts when using containers and EKS, hence that's a Ghana. So what are left? Option A, which is Lambda for compute layer in the architecture because it is a serverless, so the least amount of architecture infrastructure management okay so that's one and the second option is like exactly once delivery and asynchronous and etc so for that we are going to use sqs fifo queues as messaging component between the compute layers why this one because sqs fifo provides exactly once message processing and ordered delivery of messages FIFO queues ensures that messages are processed in the order they are received and are delivered exactly once. This helps in maintaining the integrity of the payment processing application. In summary, we use Lambda for compute layers and SQS FIFO queues as the messaging component. A company has a nightly batch processing routine that analyzes report files that an on-premises file system receives daily through sftp the company wants to move the solution to aws cloud the solution might be highly available must be highly available and resilient the solutions also must minimize operational effort okay so the solution must be highly available and resilient which means whatever you are going to use think of having it on multiple availability zone right that's what this is talking about so keep that in mind now, whenever you hear anything about SFTP or file trans FTPing, etc. on AWS, there is only one service which you can use and which you should use if you want to have high availability and resiliency and etc. which is and along with minimize operational effort, you need to use a service that is uh, created by AWS, right? Yes, we do have one which is the AWS transfer. So we can immediately eliminate A and B, uh, sorry, B and C because they are not using this one. They are trying to create their own solution. Obviously you can, but we want to minimize operational effort. So A and D uses transfer. So we'll go with this. But which one will we use? What are you going to use A or D? Now let's look at what is the difference between these two options. Option A, both are uh, this is going to be deployed using sftp to efs file system for storage then use an ec2 instance in auto scaling group with scheduled scaling policies to run batch and here we are going to use s3 bucket for storage modify the application to pull the batch files from s3 to ec2 for processing use an ec2 instance in auto scaling with so when you compare with efs and s3 obviously we will go with s3 because of its high availability and resilience compared with any other storage service and you can use efs but again this is the better option compared with that okay which also minimizes the operational effort because you don't have to set up s3 I mean, just create the bucket and done with it compared with efs wherein you would have to uh, do a setup A company has users all around the world accessing its HTTP-based 
application deployment on EC2 instances in multiple regions. The company wants to improve the availability and performance of the application. The company also wants to protect the application against common web exploits that may affect availability, compromise security, consume excessive resources. Static IP addresses are required. So whenever you see something like static IP addresses, only one thing should come to your mind. What is that? If you are asking, what is that? Global accelerator, because that provides you to have static IP addresses. Just remember that one thing, which will solve a lot of issues for you. And whenever you see all around the world, only two things should come to your mind, which are uh, CloudFront and Global Accelerator, right? But again, when you see static IP addresses, you will come, it will come down to only Global Accelerator. And whenever you think of Global Accelerator, you should think of what? Usually you will think of NLBs. But this is a HTTP based application, so you cannot think of NLB because NLBs work at layer 3 and 4, right? Where they are more of in uh, TCP and etc. So let's look at this. Let's look at the explanations for each of this. But I just gave you the trick that using that trick, you can immediately eliminate C and D because these don't have global accelerator only a and b has and using the http based you can eliminate nlb because this doesn't support http and https only lb does so that will give us the answer b but let's go through the options all right see option a which we already know is not the right one why because we have nlbs okay as you already know nlbs are designed for handling tcp udp traffic and are often used for high performance low latency requirements and we are also using waf on nlbs provides protection against common web exploits similar to alb option and uh, we are also using global accelerators everything work out works out other than the nlb factor then if you look at c Again, we already know this is not the right option. Uh, put the EC2 instances behind NLB, deploy WAF on the NLBs, create cloud front distribution. Similar to option A, NLBs are used for load balancing and WAF is deployed on them for security. Cloud front is introduced as CDN to improve content delivery and leverage, etc. But again, this won't work out because of NLB. You might be thinking, well, you have ALB, it works with um the http based but again remember the static ip addresses scenario how are you going to do that with a cloud front distribution right so for that reason option b works out for all the scenarios provided in the question http based application deployment static ip addresses using alb and global accelerator a company's data platform uses an amazon aurora mysql database the database has multiple read replicas and multiple DB instances across different availability zones. Users have recently reported errors from the database that indicate that there are too many connections. So whenever you see too many connections, there is only one answer, which is RDS proxy or proxy in general. Too many connections, go with proxy, forget about all this. Easy, right? I know. A company stores text files in S3. The text files include customer chat messages, date and time information, and customer personally identifiable information. The company needs a solution to provide samples of the conversation to an external service provider for quality control. The external service provider needs to randomly pick sample conversations up to most recent conversation. The company must not share the customer PII with the external service provider. Okay, we are not sharing the personal identifiable with the X. The solution must scale when the number of customer conversation increases and we have to do with least operational overhead. Least operational overhead. Let's see if are there any EC2. Yeah, I see two EC2s. You can immediately go and cross them out because using EC2 instances is completely opposite to least operational overhead so let's cross them out and then we have a and d let's look at option d what are we doing here we are creating an dynamo db table 
will and creating lambda function that reads only the data in the files that does not contain PII. Then we'll configure lambda function to store the non-PII data in the DynamoDB table when a new file is written to S3. Then we are granting external service provider access to DynamoDB. This option involves using DynamoDB as a storage solution for non-PII data and an associated lambda function for processing. Okay, and while DynamoDB is a scalable and managed service, it introduces additional complexity compared with option A, right? Especially with the need to manage data storage and access controls. Why, why is this easy? So let's go through what makes this better than option D. Here we are creating an object lambda access point. What is that? We'll learn about it in a minute. Then we are going to create a lambda function that redax the PII when the function reads the file. Redax means it will either uh, eliminate it or puts, whenever there is PII, it will be put random characters like XXX or hash hash symbols. With That is the redacting. If you have ever seen a spy movie and when they see these secret documents where it is like either marked or crossed or you know, uh, removed, that is called redacting. And we are instructing the external service provider to access the object lambda access point. So what exactly is that? Well, object lambda access points allow for custom processing of S3 object data before returning it to the requester. A lambda function can be attached to access point to redact PII from the text files dynamically when they are accessed. This ensures that the external pro service provider receives only redacted information without PII. And we are not using DynamoDB here. See, obviously using S3 is way better than using DynamoDB. And we are using Lambda function which provides a serverless, scalable and low operational overhead, overhead environment for processing. But we wouldn't pick this because if we don't know object Lambda access point, we wouldn't, right? But they are trying to test you this particular feature. A company is running a legacy system on an Amazon EC2 instance. The application code cannot be modified and the system cannot run on more than one instance. A solutions architect must design a resilient solution that can improve the recovery time for the system. What should the solutions architect recommend to meet this requirement? Option one says enable termination protection for the city instances. Well, what does termination protection do? It prevents an ECT instance from being terminated accidentally. While this helps avoid accidental termination, it does not address the broader goal of improving recovery time for the system. If the instant fails or becomes available, unavailable, termination protection alone does not provide a mechanism for automatic recovery or failover. Hence, that's a goner. Configure for multi-AZ. Multi-AZ deployment involves running the EC2 instance in multiple availability zones providing high availability and fault tolerance. In the event of a failure in one availability zone, the instance can fail over to another. However, this option assumes that the application can run in multiple instances and that it is acceptable for the system to run in a different instance. Since the legacy application cannot run on more than one instance, this option may not be applicable. Then let's go ahead and look at option D. This option focuses on storage redundancy using RAID configurations. While this can provide data redundancy and protect against certain types of storage failures, it does not address the recovery time for the entire system. In the event of an AC2 instance failure, the recovery process would still depend on manual intervention to launch a new instance and restore data from the redundant storage. Hence, this is a corner. So what is the right option? Create an CloudWatch alarm to recover the EC2 instance in case of failure. Why? Because CloudWatch alarm can be configured to detect failures or issues and trigger an automated recovery action. The recovery action could be implemented using Lambda functions or other automation tools. While this option does not modify the application code, it introduces operational automation for system recovery. A company wants to deploy its containerized application workloads to a VPC across three availability zones. 
the company needs a solution that is highly available across the available uh, available across availability zones the solution must require minimal changes to the application which solution will meet these requirements least operational overhead again our least operational overhead logic should apply here as well let's go through the options use eks self managed nodes configure application auto scaling to use target tracking scaling set the minimum capacity to 3 this option involves using kubernetes Conf Kubernetes configuring application auto scaling on self managed nodes allows you to automatically adjust the number of nodes based on resource utilization. Setting the minimum capacity to 3 ensures that there are always at least 3 nodes available for running containers. This solution provides high availability without requiring significant changes to the application. This will work, but we have another option um, which is also a solution so let's put this on hold for now we'll come back to this one and let's look at option c which is uh, use amazon ec2 instance reserved instances this option involves using what ec2 instances with reserved instances and a spread placement group for distributing instances across available zones, configuring an auto scaling group with target tracking scaling ensures that the desired capacity is adjusted based on target metrics. This solution requires more management of EC2 inst instances but still achieves high availability with minimal changes to the application. Since we need least operational, this is a goner. And option D involves using Lambda which is a serverless compute service. While it can be used for certain types of workloads, it may not be suitable for long running or stateful applications that require a VPC connection. The configuration of application auto scaling with Lambda as a scalable target may not align with the typical use case for serverless applications or functions. Additionally, the option doesn't align well with the goal of deploying containerized application workloads to a VPC across three availability zones. So, so many uh, options that are telling us not to go with this. So the option is between A and B, but we usually go with EKS only if you have already EKS on on-premise when you migrate to uh, AWS, you are you will are going to go with EKS. Otherwise, ECS is your better solution. And this clearly doesn't mention anything about Kubernetes, so we don't have to go with Kubernetes whatsoever. So instead, we will go with this one, which is ECS. Then we'll configure ECS auto scaling. Same thing similar to this. Set the minimum capacity to 3. Then we'll set the task placement strategy type to spread with an availability zone attribute. Okay, so this solution is designed for high availability with minimal changes to the application, right? So if you, you might be asking, setting the task placement strategy spread with an availability zone ensures that tasks are spread evenly across availability zones. That's the setting we are looking at here. That is not provided here. You need to note that as well. A media company stores movies in S3. Each movie is stored in a single video file that ranges from 1 GB to 10 GB. The company must be able to provide the streaming content of a movie within 5 minutes of a user purchase. There is higher demand for movies that are less than 20 years old than for movies that are more than 20 years old. The company wants to minimize hosting service costs based on demand. Okay, makes sense because most of us don't watch movies that are older than 20 compared with new movies, right? So let's go ahead and see what is our solution. So option A says uh, using S3 lifecycle policies to automatically transition data to infrequent uh, storage class when demand decreases. While this reduces storage costs, it may not be optimal for scenarios with varying and unpredictable access patterns. As transitioning data back to S3 standard from IA incurs additional retrieval costs. Right? So, for that reason, we are not going to go with this. Option B uses standard storage class for newer movies and standard infrequent access for older movies 
Standard infrequent access provides lower storage costs compared to standard but with slightly higher retrieval costs. Retrieving video files using standard retrieval may result in faster access compared to glacial retrieval, op uh, glacial retrieval options. However, it may not be the most cost effective solution for infrequently access to older movies. Then we have option D which is um, this option D uh, stores newer movies in S3 standard similar to B and older movies in glacier flexible retrieval instead of infrequent access. Okay, so retrieving video files using bulk retrieval in Glacier is the most cost effective but has a longer retrieval time compared to expedited and standard retrieval. This option may not meet the 5 minute retrieval requirement right? because they want the movie within 5 minutes. Doesn't matter if it is 20 years older or newer. If you are going to use the bulk retrieval, I think it is between 12 to 48 hours something like that. So obviously that is a big no for that one. So what would we do? We will instead use C where we are going to use intelligence tiering. Why? Because this op automatically optimizes cost based on access patterns. Older movies are stored in glacier flexible retrieval and expedited retrieval is used when a user orders an older movie which is within 5 minutes because it takes 1 to 5 minutes to get it from glacier uh, storage class making it suitable for meeting the 5 minute retrieval requirements and it intelligently moves instead of we telling older newer movies move maybe there will be some older movies where you know people are accessing right so we need to put those in the glacier based on the access pattern not just because they are older movies we do put it okay so this makes more sense in this scenario than using infrequent access a solutions architect needs to design the architecture for an application that a vendor provides as a docker container image the container needs 50 gb of storage available for temporary files the infrastructure must be serverless which solution meets these requirements with the least operational overhead okay this is an interesting question let's go through the options um Create Lambda function that uses Docker container image with an Amazon S3 mounted volume that has more than 50 GB of space. Lambda does not directly support Docker containers with persistent storage like S3 mounted volumes. While Lambda can use temporary storage for the duration of the function execution, it may not be suitable for long term storage needs. Hence, that's a gone off. Option B, again Lambda. It, again, it doesn't support attaching EBS volumes to the function for persistent storage. Lambda is primarily for stateless, event-driven, serverless computing and attaching EBS volumes directly is not a common pattern. So let's eliminate that one as well. Option C and D both are using ECS cluster but one with Fargate which is serverless obviously whenever you use operational overhead serverless is way better than using ec to launch type but let's go through this one option while ecs itself is a container orchestration service using ec to launch type with ebs volumes introduces the need for managing ec2 instances this option doesn't align with the serverless requirement and involves more operational overhead compared with fargate hence we will go with option c We are going with ECS with Fargate, which is a serverless compute engine for containers. Then the use of Amazon EFS allows for persistent storage across multiple containers and instances. This approach meets the requirement for providing 50 GB of storage and is serverless as it utilizes Fargate. A company needs to use its on-premises LDAP directory service to authenticate its users to the console management console the directory service is not compatible with security assertion markup language or saml which solution meets these requirements 
we have seen uh, identity center when we talk about ID IDPs, right? But here we are talking about LDAP. So do you think this will be the right option? No, because SSO is designed to simplify AWS access management for business users and administrators. It supports integration with on-premise directories, but is primarily but it primarily uses SAML for federation. Since the on-premises LDAP directory is not compatible with SAML, option A may not be suitable for the given scenario. Option B suggests creating an IAM policy that uses AWS credentials and integrating it into LDAP. However, IAM policies are typically associated with IA, IA, AWS identities not directly integrated into LDAP. This option doesn't align with common practices for federated authentication. Then we have option C. Rotating IAM credentials whenever LDAP credentials are updated introduces complexity and operational overhead. Additionally, IAM credentials are typically long-lived and this approach does not provide the typical SSO experience that federated authentication solutions offer. Then leaves us with option D. This involves creating a custom identity broker application or process on premises that communicates with AWS security token service to obtain short lived credentials. This custom solution acts as a broker between the on premises LDAP directory and AWS. It provides a way to obtain temporary security credentials without the need for direct LDAP compatibility. This is a common approach for scenarios where SAML is not an option. A company stores multiple Amazon machine images in an AWS account to launch its Amazon EC2 instances. The AMIs contain critical data and configurations that are necessary for the company's operations. The company wants to implement a solution that will recover accidentally deleted AMIs quickly and efficiently. Which solution will meet these requirements? Least operational overhead. Again, what does least operational overhead means? Look for a feature that is available in the services that the question is asking. Okay, let's go ahead and look at the options. Option A involves creating EBS snapshots of the volumes associated with the AMIs and storing these snapshots in separate AWS accounts. EBS snapshots are a point in time copy of EBS volumes and can be used to recreate volumes. Storing snapshots in a separate AWS account provides an additional layer of isolation and protection against accidental deletion. Okay, but what are we trying to do here? It will recover accidental deleted AMS quickly and efficiently. Are these going to do that? Even though we just learned A can do it, but is it least operational overhead? I don't think so because you have to create the snapshots, then store them, and then you have to recover them, etc. That is too much operational overhead. So that's we are not going to go with that one. And option B suggests periodically copying all AMIs to another AWS account. While this can provide a backup in a different account, it involves manual or scripted periodic copying, which may introduce delays between updates and potential operational overhead. No, no. And option D suggests uploading the AMIs to S3 bucket and enabling cross-region replication to replicate the data to another region. While S3 cross-region replication is a good practice for data durability, it might not be the most straightforward solution for quickly recovering accidentally deleted AMIs. Hence, we are left with option C and this is the correct answer. And this is a feature. So obviously, this is the least operational overhead. You don't have to create a solution like option A. Okay, so what does this do exactly? Option C, using AWS backups recycle bin feature by creating retention rules. This is a valid and effective solution for quickly recovering so this is our perfect solution for this scenario. Maybe, you know, go through the recycle bin. If you haven't heard about it, it is available as part of uh, AWS backup. 
A company has 150 TB of archived image data stored on premises that needs to be moved to the AWS cloud within the next month. The company's current network connection allows up to 100 Mbps uploads for this purpose during the night only, which means we don't even have 24 hours. What is the most cost effective mechanism to move this data and meet? And I mean, they have to move it within the next month, which is one month. And moving 150 TB with 100 Mbps, it's impossible over the network. So any option that is listed here through network, you can immediately eliminate them because of that one. So which is option C and D. But let's go through this. Option C, S3 transfer acceleration, which uses CloudFront's globally distributed edge locations to accelerate uploads to S3. While this can improve upload speeds, it might not be the most cost effective solution, especially considering the limited upload speed of 100 Mbps. Transfer acceleration might incur additional cost based on usage. It's not free. And option D, creating S3 VPC endpoint and establishing a VPN could improve the security and performance of the data transfer compared to using public internet. However, the limited upload speed of 100 Mbps might still be a bottleneck and the VPN might introduce additional latency. Okay. Which we already figured it out like over the network it's impossible. Then you have both A and B both are not over the network using devices but which one will you pick? Snowball devices or snowmobile? Obviously you won't use snowmobile because Snowmobile is what? It's like a transformer looking truck, you know, that big truck kind of storage, which is not used for 150 TBs. It's not used for TBs of data. Instead, it is used for petabytes of data. Okay, if you have TBs of data, use multiple snowmobile devices, which is option B talking about. A company wants to migrate its three tier application from on premises to AWS. The web tier and the application tier are running on third party virtual machines. The database tier is running on MySQL. The company needs to migrate the application by making the fewest possible changes to the architecture. The company also needs a database solution that can restore data to a specific point in time. Which solution will meet these requirements least operational overhead? Again, Either use a feature which they are talking about on-premise or so not a feature. They are talking about specific AWS services, not try to create your own solution. Um, let's go through option D. First of all, I mean, this is an easy answer. You can easily pick it based on whenever you have these kind of three tier application uh, architecture. The first tier, which is the web tier, usually will be in public subnet and the remaining will be in private because you need to expose your website to users, right? So if you put all in private subnet, then you cannot access it at all. So for that reason, the web tier is usually put in public and the remaining in private. So with that assumption, you can immediately eliminate option A because everything is in private subnets. And you can eliminate option D as well because everything is in public subnet. Both option B and C are similar. The only difference is this is Aurora MySQL and this is RDS for MySQL and both will work and both have the restore data to a specific point in time, point in uh, time recovery option. But RDS, you need to set it up a little bit operational overhead compared with Aurora because Aurora comes along with it, not much. So we'll go with this option than option C. A development team is collaborating with another company to create an integrated product. The other company needs to access an SQS queue that is contained in the development team's account. The company wants to pull the queue without giving up its own account permission to do so. How should a solutions architect provide access to SQS queue? Create instance profile that provides the other company access to SQS queue. Um, instance profiles are used to grant IAM roles to EC2 instances. They are typically associated with EC2 instances rather than external entities. This option may not be suitable for granting access to another company as it's primarily designed for EC2 instances. Option B, IAM policies are used to grant permissions to AWS users, groups, roles. 
you can create a policy that allows the other company's AWS identity to interact with the SQS queue. This is a common and appropriate approach for cross account access. Okay, this is a totally valid approach. Uh, but uh, what is the option that we are going to choose? I will mention in a minute. And then we have option D, which is using SNS, which is a pub sub messaging service, and it can be used to send messages to SQS queues. However, this option introduces additional complexity by involving SNS, which may not be necessary for a simple queuing polling scenario. It's generally more straightforward to use SQS access policy instead. So let's cross this up. So both BC will work, but which one will you choose? Okay, I will go with SQS because um, whenever you have, you know, I mean, this is a debated con topic because some people will try to restrict access at IAM level, IAM policy level, some at the service level. So it's up to you, but the choice between them may depend on factors like whether you want to manage access through IAM or directly through SQS policies. Both options allow you to grant fine-grained permissions for the other company to poll the SQS queue without exposing broader permissions in their AWS account. So I would go ahead with the SQS access policy instead of at the IAM. A company's developers want a secure way to gain SSH access on the company's Amazon EC2 instances that run the latest version of Linux. The developers work remotely and in the corporate office. The company wants to use AWS services as a part of the solution. The EC2 instances are hosted in a VPC private subnet and access the internet through a NAT gateway that is deployed in a public subnet. Which, what should a solutions architect do to meet these requirements? most cost effectively okay how do you do that let's look at it option a involves setting up a bastion host within the vpc and using ec2 instance connect for the secure ssh access granting ec2 create vpn connection iam permission is not necessary for SSH access, but might be included for future VPN connections. This option provides secure SSH access using EC2 instance connect. Okay. And grant this one, which is irrelevant to this one, whatever they are trying to do. And creating a bastion host means uh, installing another subnet and having all that, which involves a little bit um what do you call it cost right because you are introducing another ec2 if you don't know what a bastion host is bastion means it's a separate server set up so that people can log into that and access their applications from within that server so only that server will have access to their services not your company laptop you cannot so you, you will log into your company laptop then you will go into that bastion server and the server will be used to access other services. That's basically what a bastion server means. Option B involves setting up a site-to-site -site VPN connection between the corporate network and the VPC. While this provides a secure connection, it might introduce more complexity and operational overhead. Managing VPN connections for remote and corporate networks could be challenging. So too much setup involved in here. And option C is similar to option A, where it is creating a bastion host. And here it's saying same subnet as the EC2 instances. Oh, okay, I missed that part. Again, if you are going to create, uh, yeah, that one. Whereas here you are going to do that in a public subnet and restricting access based on security groups and SSH keys. It provides a secure way for developers to access the EC2 instances remotely and from the corporate network. This is a commonly used approach for secure SSH access, which I was talking about. But again, you are hosting it on a different EC2 instance. Again, it's not cost effective. So that will leave us with option D. Why is this the right answer? Well, let's look at it. This involves using AWS Systems Manager Session Manager. If you haven't heard about that, you can go ahead and watch the projects that I mentioned in the beginning of the video where we use this systems 
manager session manager pretty much in all the projects at least about 50 projects we use the session manager to log in into ec2 instances because this provides a secure and auditable way to access ec2 instances it eliminates the need for a bastion host which means you don't have to spin another ec2 instance and allows access directly through the management console this can be cost effective and efficient solution a pharmaceutical company is developing a new drug the volume of data that the company generates has grown exponentially over the past few months the company's researchers regularly require a subnet of subset of the entire data set to be immediately available with minimal lag immediately a subset however the entire data set does not need to be accessed on a daily basis all the data currently resides in on premises storage arrays and the company wants to reduce ongoing capital expenses which storage solution should a solutions or recommend to meet these requirements okay let's go through them one some of these you already heard about them something like data sync you might be thinking oh yeah migrating data from on premise to this is that well sure you can use uh, for efficient data transfer between on premises and s3 and uh, they are also talking about schedule cron jobs that can automate these transfers but how would you handle the scenario where they are talking about uh, require some set of entire data set immediately with minimal lag obviously that is not possible right using data sync because the data will be completely synced onto your s3 bucket okay and when you are syncing they are not talking about are you removing the existing data let's say they are not removing existing data then what obviously then they are not reducing any ongoing capital expenses instead they are increasing it by storing in both places so that's a no no and then you have option b and c both use storage gateway we'll come back to that let's go through option d in, in the meantime this involves using efs file system which might not be most optimal for scenarios requiring immediate access to minimal lag for subsets of data same as this one even if you move your entire data let's say you are using this to move your entire data using vpn to this one what about when they want immediately data with minimal lag even though it is a subset right they only want subset not the entire data set so you have to again read from this again there will be a lag no no matter whether you use vpn correction or not so clearly we are going to use storage gateway b c but which one of them are you going to use obviously i'm not going to use b because you are going to write data to s3 bucket so whenever you want again this one this will defeat that because you have to again read back from there okay subset of it not is going to work but option c uses volume gateway with cached volumes with s3 bucket as target so what does this do this stores frequently accessed data locally for low latency access and asynchronously backing up the entire data set to s3 so you don't have to store the entire data set on the on premise which reduces the capital expenses but you can still access uh, a subset of the entire data set using the cache mechanism that's why i will go with option c a company has a business critical application that runs on ec2 instances the application stores data in dynamo db table the company must be able to revert the table to any point within last 24 hours which solution meets these requirements with least operational overhead so whatever they are asking is called ptr point in time recovery which we have discussed in one of the previous questions and that being said you can all you already know this one just like rds and aurora supports ptr dynamodb also supports ptr by default so all you have to do is configure it and get done with it but let's look at other options use aws backup for the table while backup is a comprehensive service for managing backups across various resources for dynamodb tables using PITR might be simpler and more cost effective and least operational overhead as well because this is the feature of the service that is asked in the question so obviously that is way better than trying to use another service that is not mentioned in the question same goes with C you can use lambda function uh, but 
you have to manually do and skip, do that. Uh, first of all, you need to create a function. Then whatever you are doing, it is, um, you can automate this, but they didn't talk about scheduling. Uh, they did back off of table every hour and so. So too much operational overhead. Same goes with uh, D. So you don't have to even do that. So the best option is just configure the PITR or PITR for this table in DynamoDB, which is available. A company hosts an application used to upload files to an S3 bucket. Once uploaded, the files are processed to extract metadata, which takes less than five seconds. The volume and frequency of the uploads varies from a few files each hour to hundreds of concurrent uploads. The company has asked a solutions architect to design a cost-effective architecture that will meet these requirements. What should the solutions architect recommend? Okay, let's look at the options. Option A talks about configuring cloud trails to log S3 API calls, then use AppSync to process the files. AppSync is primarily designed for building GraphQL APIs and may not be the most suitable for directly processing and extracting metadata from files uploaded to S3. And then option C is using Kinesis data streams to process and send data to S3, then invoking Lambda function to process the files. This introduces additional complexity and may be overkill for a scenario where files need to be processed quickly after upload. And option D is using SNS to process the files uploaded to S3. And then we are going to invoke Lambda function. Okay. SNS is more suitable for pub sub messaging. And while it can invoke Lambda functions, it adds unnecessary complexity for a simple file processing task. So what are we going to do? We are going to configure object created event notification within S3 bucket to invoke Lambda function to process the files. This is a common scenario and we have done this in our real-time projects playlist that I mentioned, where I think not just once, I can at least five to 10 projects we have done this. So why this is the right option? Well, because you are leveraging S3 event notifications to trigger Lambda function when an object is created and Lambda provides serverless compute service, allowing the execution of code without the need to provision any managed services. A company's application is deployed on EC2 instances and uses AWS Lambda functions for an event-driven architecture. The company uses non-production development environments in a different AWS account to test new features before the company deploys the features to production. The production instances show constant usage because of customers in different time zones. The company uses non-production instances only during business hours on weekends. So non-production only during work hours, production 24-7. The company does not use the non-production instances on weekends. Got it. The company wants to optimize the cost to run its applications on AWS. Which solution will meet these requirements most cost effectively? What do you think? Option A use trying to use on demand for production, which is completely wrong because production is 24 seven. Whenever you have 24 seven, you will try to use what? Any, anyone? You will try to use either reserved instances or compute savings plans, which we will talk about. But the question didn't mention anything about uh, contracts, that's fine. Preserved instances, if you are using 24 seven, it's assumed that's the case. So you can immediately eliminate option A because they are saying use on demand for production, which is a big red flag, eliminate it. Option B is talking about reserved instances for production and non-prod. Well, for prod, it makes sense, but for non-prod, no, no reserved because it only runs eight hours during business hours only on weekdays. So why do you want to use reserved instances for non-prod? And they're talking about to shut down, whether you shut down them, shut them or shut, not shut down them. Reserved instances are yearly 
one year or three years they are you are already paying it if you are going to shut it down you will still have to pay so that's the not the answer and dedicated host you will only use if you have a specific requirement in the question if they are asking about uh, uh, you know core based license etc scenario then only you will use dedicated host otherwise or if they say they have compliance issues wherein they have to run their applications only on a dedicated uh, server then only you will use that so that will leave us with compute savings plans for production instances okay um, if you don't know what this is savings plan provides significant cost savings for a commitment to a consistent amount of compute usage for a one or three year term this is suitable for production instances that show constant usage and on demand for non-prod makes sense because when you can shut them down and when you shut down on demand there won't be any charge unlike reserved instances a company stores data in an on-premises oracle relational database the company needs to make the data available in Amazon Aurora PostgreSQL for analysis. The company uses AWS site-to-site -site VPN connection to connect its on-premises network to AWS. The company must capture the changes that occur to the source database during the migration to Aurora PostgreSQL. Which requirements? So first of all, you are trying to convert Oracle to PostgreSQL. So it is not apples to apples. So whenever that conversion is involved, you might think, oh, I want to use DMS sure you can use dms but dms alone is not going to solve the problem if you are going to move oracle to oracle mysql to mysql sure dms will work out but if you are moving one vendor to another vendor you have to use another one along with dms which is called aws schema conversion tool which in short is sct so which is option a and c so you can blindly go ahead and eliminate the other two and by the way, other two are not even using DMS, so forget about it. They are trying to reinvent the wheel or create their own solution, so you don't have to do that. DMS takes care of the migration of the databases from on-premises to cloud. Okay, And both are using SCT, so we have to go through the options to figure out which one do we have to do use. And if I go through A, it's saying until here it is the same. And even till here, it is same. What is the difference? A says full load migration tasks, but they clearly said capture the changes that occur to the source during the migration. Okay, so that is only handled by migrate the existing data and replicate the ongoing changes. Right? When if you use full load, what about the changes that come after the full load? You are they are being ignored, which is not what we want. So when you do this. When you replicate the ongoing changes, it will make sure any changes that happen after the migration are replicated to the PostgreSQL database. A company built an application with Docker containers and needs to run the application in cloud. The company wants to use a managed service to host the application. The solution must scale in and out appropriately according to demand on the individual container services. The solution also must not result in additional operational overhead or infrastructure to manage. Whenever they say that we already know, we have to go with serverless. So which one do you think? Whenever you see forget, obviously, sure, yeah, let's go ahead. But what will you choose between A and B? ECS, EKS. I already mentioned EKS you will only go if the question literally says it is a Kubernetes containers, etc. Okay, Other than, otherwise don't go with that because Kubernetes is, um, is a third party tool, right? It's not a AWS tool. So only if the on-premise has been using Kubernetes, then okay, sure, use the Kubernetes on Amazon. Otherwise, just use the ECS with AWS Fargate. Now coming to CDE, which one we are going to use? Again, we cannot use D for the same reason why we, we cannot use B. Between C and D, which one? Obviously, we are not going to use D. Okay, looks like A, B, D, E are all interchangeable. Anyways, we cannot use this because you are having using EC2 worker nodes, which is again operational overhead. Instead, what will you do? We will provision an API gateway API, connect the API to Lambda function to run the containers. This is the uh, 
not default but the industry standard lambda is used not just to run the containers to run other services as well like for example you can call redshift api or you can call let's say any machine learning uh, service uh, using lambda as well okay you will use api gateway then it will integrate with lambda which will trigger lambda then lambda will call this call that's how you know you, you usually design uh, in aws and by the way we have designed like at least 50 projects using this concept so go check out our project so that is that's why i'm telling you if you want to learn along with preparing for this then i would recommend you to go watch those projects because most of these questions are actually implemented as projects in those playlists an e-commerce company is running a seasonal online sale the company hosts its website on ec2 instances spanning multiple available zones the company wants its website to manage sudden traffic increases during the sale which solution will meet these requirements most cost effectively let's look at the options option a create an auto scaling group that is large enough to handle peak traffic load okay so that is very vague what do you mean by large enough you, you are not going to do that uh, stop half of the amazon ec2 instances Configure the auto scaling group to use the stopped instances to scale out when traffic increases. What? This leads to inefficiencies and increased costs as maintaining stopped instances still incurs charges without contributing to capacity. Restarting instances might introduce delays. Okay, so big no no. And then we have option B create auto scaling group for the website. Set the minimum size of the auto scaling group so that it can handle high traffic volumes without the need to scale out. Well, how are you going to decide the minimum size? Because you don't know how much the traffic is going to be. Let's say if you're setting 10, if you don't have that much traffic, then how are you going to scale out? So this is again, no, you don't do that. And then let's look at option C. Use CloudFront and Elastic Cache to cache dynamic content with an auto scaling group set as origin. Configure the auto scaling group with the instances necessary to populate confident and elastic cache scale in after the cache is fully okay so for scaling in and out nobody uses this kind of setup at all cloud front and elastic cache with dyna uh, did they say dynamo db they didn't but still no nobody uses it because you, there is so much complexity involved in here wherein you are using cloud front elastic cache auto scaling nah so all there we have to do is configure the ACG or uh, auto scaling group um, to scale out as traffic increases. How do you do that? You can do it using it's uh, one of the uh, scaling mechanisms. There are different scaling mechanisms, right? So you are just going to use auto scaling group. You don't need any other service to do that. Okay, because it provides elasticity automatically scaling out to handle increased traffic. And then you will you create a launch template to start new instances from a pre-configured AMI. You are not going to start and stop the instance and instance. You are going to use a pre uh, create launch template. I mean, if you ever use the uh, auto scaling, you would understand. It's pretty simple. And we have done one, one or two projects on auto scaling in our cloud projects. So go check it out. Uh, but yeah, this is what you do. You won't try to use other tools to set this up. It's very easy. That is the purpose of auto scaling, scale in and out. A solutions architect must to provide an automated solution for a company's compliance policy that states security groups cannot include a role that allows SSH from this. The company needs to be notified if there is any breach in policy. A solution is needed as soon as possible. What should the solutions architect do to meet least operation overhead? Whenever you see a question wherein they talk about you should be notified when there is breach in policy. Any configuration changes, if you want to be notified, just think of any option that has AWS config because we already know AWS config um, uh, manages the configuration changes and etc. Right. So for that reason, we'll go with that. And luckily for us, only one option uses that. So the answer is B, but let's go through these options. 
write lambda script that monitors security groups for ssh being open to you can totally do that but again it says least operational overhead so either use a specific service that is designed for that or, or a feature since there is no mention of any service so the next thing is pick a service that is specifically designed for this which is config why do you want to do it using lambda when you have that service option c create iam role with permissions to globally open security and network <laughs> Seriously, that first sentence itself is good enough for us to not pick that. Configure a CP that prevents non-administrative users from creating and editing security groups. Yes, you can do that at an organization level. Create a notification in the ticketing system when a user requests a rule that needs. But again, our what do we want? We want to be notified of it. We don't want to, nowhere in the question it says restrict it or etc. So, no. So, let's go ahead with our answer a wherein you enable the restricted ssh config uh, in the config manage rule and generate sns notifications when a non-compliant is rule created and we have performed this one as well in our projects i know that i am repeating it again and again but trust me i'm not making it up go check the projects there is a project where we did exactly this thing okay use amazon elastic kubernetes service with ec2 worker nodes see here they are, are mentioning you have to use it right in these scenarios we will if there if the question is asking about if they are migrating to cloud we would but it looks like they are already in the cloud company has deployed an application in aws account the application consists of microservices that run on aws lambda and eks a separate team supports each microservice. The company has multiple AWS accounts and wants to give each team its own account for its microservices. A solutions architect needs to design a solution that will provide service to service communication over HTTPS. The solution also must provide a service registry for service discovery. Which solution will meet these requirements with the least administrative overhead? So they are talking about administrative, not operational here. That's fine. Okay. First of all, um, let's see what are the options that we have. Option A, create an inspection VPC, deploy AWS network firewall to the inspection VPC, attach the VPC to new transit gateway, route VPC to VPC traffic to the inspection VPC, apply firewall rules to allow only HTTPS communication. Okay, this can be done, but it involves setting up a separate inspection VPC and transit gateway that is completely against the least administrative overhead. So obviously no, you still can use the same tip I gave you. Least means try to use a feature or a service and let's go with option c here they are trying to use nlb with http listener and target groups for each microservice and create an aws private link into point service for each microservice create an interface vpc endpoint in each vpc that needs to consume that microservice you already know nlb doesn't support https so cross it out and option d is talking about using peering connection between vpcs that can 10 microservices create a prefix list for each service that requires a connection to a client create route tables to route traffic to appropriate vpc then create security groups to allow only https communication again you can do this you can uh, create vpc peering and have all this possible but here you have too much manual configuration for routing and security groups and we want least administrative. So for that reason, we are not going to go with that. So what are you going to use then if we are saying everything is too much administrative? Well, we'll go ahead and use this, which is option B, wherein we are going to use something called create a VPC lattice service network. Then we will associate the microservices with the service network. Then define HTTPS listeners for each service, register the microservice, compute resources as targets, 
and identify VPCs that need to communicate with the services, then associate those VPCs with the service network. If you see, we are doing everything in the VPC itself. We are not creating any security groups or we are not doing anything else other than using the VPC alone. If you don't know what VPC lattice is, let me open a link for you. Okay, this is what it looks like. Service network is a logical boundary for a collection of services, which is what our question is asking for the microservices, right? Services associated with the network can be authorized to discovery. This is a nice document. Go ahead and read and look at these diagrams. You will understand why our option we are picking the VPC lattice. Okay, you can just search with this one. You'll get it. A company has a mobile game that reads most of its metadata from an Amazon RDS DB instance. As the game increased in popularity, developers noticed slowdowns related to the game's metadata load times. Performance metrics indicate that simply scaling the database will not help. A solutions architect must explore all options that include capabilities for snapshots, replication, and sub-millisecond response times which should the solutions architect recommend to solve these issues i think a sub millisecond is a giveaway because there is only one uh, service that actually gives you sub milliseconds which is the dynamo db okay um okay so all you have to do is metadata metadata not the complete data obviously you won't store the in dynamodb that but since we are talking about metadata etc and submit only second is the giveaway here because neither aurora this which is again a rdbms it won't give it and if you are talking about ca and d which are cache solutions these can improve read performance but it may not guarantee sub millisecond response times for all use cases again these are in memory solutions so cross that out snapshots replication sub milliseconds nope instead we will go with dynamo db which has all these whistles um and you can use global tables which offer multi-region replication for high availability and again as i said low latency access sub millisecond is possible with dynamo db a company uses aws organizations for its multi-account aws setup the security organizational unit of the company needs to share approved Amazon machine images with the development OU. The AMIs are created by using AWS key management service encryption snapshots. Which solution will meet these requirements? We have to pick two of them. Add the organization's root ARN to the launch permission list for the AMIs. Adding this might give too broad permissions and may not align with the principle of least privilege. It doesn't specifically address sharing with the development teams OU, right? That's what we want to do. This doesn't talk about that. And then option D, add the development teams account, which is what option B is missing, right? Similar to... Uh, I think even A is talking about that. But anyways, this option is relevant for controlling who can launch the MIs. However, adding the entire account might be broader than necessary. Right? Because we are adding Teams account for that. So no. And option E is talking about, I mean, see, A, B, D are divided into one group and C and D are divided into another group. So if you compare A, B, D, I would instead pick a because here we are adding development teams ou arn not the teams account but the ou to launch it that's what we want here in the question that's what we are talking about with the development ou so instead i would pick this one compared with both either b or d because if you look at these two we are updating the key policy here here we are recreating the kms key and add a key policy to allow the organization's root arn to this that won't work out instead all you have to do is update the key policy to allow the development teams OU to use the aws kms keys that are used to decrypt the snapshots that's all you have to do you don't have to go and add a new key policy to the organizations not even the development so forget about it 
a data analytics company has 80 offices that are distributed globally each office hosts one petabyte of data and has between 1 and 2 gbps of internet bandwidth the company needs to perform a one time migration of a large amount of data from its office to s3 the company must complete the migration within 4 weeks which solution most cost effectively well first of all one petabyte of data in 4 weeks with 1 2 gbps is not going to work out that is for sure so that and again it's a one time migration you won't set up direct connect for one time migration because setting up direct connect takes at least a month and we need to finish everything in within four weeks that's first again once you set up this is one time what are you going to do again have you already spent money to set this cables direct connect means what you are literally cabling between uh, your companies 80 companies and then aws how much money are you going to spend doing that so no and obviously you are not going to use storage gateway volume gateway because again this is what um, uses internet bandwidth and the time required to transfer the data is not at all feasible so for that cancel very clearly we have to use a storage device but which one will you use snowmobile edge storage optimized or snowmobile so you might be thinking like previously we said oh if it is petabytes of storage don't we use snowmobile why not you know why not use the snowmobile instead of snowball well the reason is snowmobile is efficient for extremely large data volumes it might be overkill for the described scenario of 80 offices with one petabyte of data each so are you going to like um going to send 80 trucks to 80 offices so how is how are you going to finish this within four weeks no it's not visible and again one petabyte no so if i have to open the link give me a minute let me open that for you okay here is this comparison matrix and you can see it our option is between this edge storage optimized um and they didn't mention which one if you if you look at it they didn't say whether do you have to use 210 or anything but they said that one so we'll go with this and the snowmobile and as you can see it's a HTD and 100 petabytes obviously sending 100 petabyte trucks to 80 companies is not feasible and it's useless when you have one petabyte why do you instead what would you do you would instead send snowball edge storage to each company about five of them or six of them and then they will you can you know have one petabyte of it and take care of it right so for that reason I would go with option B instead of option C it didn't say one it said multiple so obviously yeah this is an overkill for it a company has an EC EFS file system that contains a reference data set the company has applications on EC2 instances that need to read the data set however the applications must not be able to change the data set the company wants to use IAM access control to prevent the applications from being able to modify or delete the data set which solution will meet these requirements let's look at the options and the question clearly says they want to use IAM access control and if you scan through these options only option B and C are using <coughs> IAM access controls and option A and option D are not using it so you can eliminate them and between B and C if you read through this create resource policy for this and add action to the IAM roles again we have discussed about identity policy and resource policies in one of the question resource policies are attached to the resources not to IAM roles so this is kind of not valid that will leave us with option C wherein we create an identity policy for the EFS file system that denies the on the EFS file system so let's pick that one a company has hired an external vendor to perform work in the company's AWS account the vendor uses an automated tool that is hosted in an AWS account that the vendor owns the vendor does not have IAM access to the company's AWS account the company who needs to grant the vendor access to the company's AWS account which solution will meet these requirements most securely most securely means think of least um, principle of least privilege you need to only provide him the access that he needs not everything so here if we go through option D 
this option involves creating an IAM user with a permission boundary that allows the vendor's account. Policies are attached to the user for required permissions. This approach uses permission boundaries for control, but direct IAM user creation might not be as secure as indirect ones, which is using roles. So whenever they talk about most securely, always try to use roles instead of users, which will also eliminate option B because they are trying to create a user and trying to do something. And C is similar to user because group is a collection of users, right? So here they are talking about grouping the vendor's IAM user in the company's IAM group and attaching policies to the group for permissions. Groups are good practice. Direct addition of external IAM users to a group in the is less secure and may not be a best practice. So don't go. Whenever they say most secure, always try to use IAM roles instead of users or groups. Okay. This involves creating cross-account IAM role to delegate access to vendor's IAM role. The role will have policy attached to the required permissions. Hence, this follows the principle of least privilege and uses cross-account roles for access. A company wants to run its experimental workloads in AWS Cloud. The company has a budget for cloud spending. The company's CFO is concerned about cloud spending accountability for dep each department. The CFO wants to receive notification when the spending threshold reaches 60% of the budget. Which solution will meet these requirements? It's simple. Whenever they want to see accountability, spending accountability for each department, whenever you see this term, each department, each account, etc., just go with tax, cost allocation tax in specific. We have discussed this option multiple times. So option A and C are talking about cost allocation tax, so you can just have them and you can eliminate the remaining options, which are B and D, okay? Because option B and D, uh, B at least it's not straightforward as AWS budgets for budget tracking and notifications. And for each department, this won't be as much straightforward as using cost allocation tags. So between A and C, what will you use? Obviously, we will go and use the budgets because C is talking about use support API and trusted advisor to create alert threshold. I mean, seriously, trusted threshold, uh, trusted advisor is used for getting recommendations uh, on best practices, based on best practices. That has nothing to do with uh, giving spending threshold 60% of Excel. That For that, you will use the service called AWS budgets. So for that reason, we will go with option A. It utilizes cost allocation tax for resource owner identification and budgets for uh, uh, budgeting and cost tracking. A company wants to deploy an internal web application on AWS. The web application must be accessible only from the company's office. The company needs to download security patches for the web application from the internet. The company has created a VPC and has configured an AWS site-to-site -site VPN connection to the company's office. Solutions architect must design a secure architecture for the web application. Which solution will meet these requirements? All right, let's look at option A talks about deploy the web application on EC2 instances in public subnets behind an application load balancer. So whenever you have an application load balancer, that will be public facing, which means you will put your ALB in the public subnet, not whatever application tier or web tier that follows you won't put that in public subnet instead you will put that in private subnet okay so because of that reason obviously this is can be eliminated immediately and then we have a similar situation here deploy the web application on ec2 in public subnet behind alb so again you can immediately cross that out Okay, now we are left with B and D and this, both web applications are in private subnets behind ALB, which is nice. What is the difference? Here, attach an internet gateway. Immediately, you can eliminate this because as soon as you attach internet gateway, you are making it public. 
okay so for that reason you won't use that instead you will use NAT gateway and that too in a public subnet why NAT gateway because for public cannot connect to your services but you can connect to public from your services for that reason you will go with NAT gateways it's as simple as that this might look scary but when you try uh, when you divide these you can eliminate most of them a company man maintains its accounting records in a custom application that runs on EC2 instances. The company needs to migrate the data to an AWS managed service for development and maintenance of application data. The solution must require minimal operational support and provide immutable cryptographically verifiable logs of data changes. Which solution will meet these most cost effectively? Okay, so whenever you hear the cryptographically verifiable logs of data changes, I think there is only one thing that supports that, which is uh, option D, copy the records from application into a quantum ledger database. If you never heard about it, I guess it is time for you to go it. This is designed for ledger style applications providing a transparent, immutable, cryptographically verifiable transaction log it is suitable for use cases where you need an immutable and transparent log of all changes which is what our question is asking so we don't have to go through any of this a company's marketing data is uploaded from multiple sources to amazon s3 bucket a series of data preparation jobs aggregate the data for reporting the data preparation jobs need to run at regular intervals in parallel a few jobs need to run in a specific order later. The company wants to remove the operational overhead of job error handling, retry logic, and state management. Which solution will meet these requirements? I mean, clearly whenever you hear error handling, retry logic, state management, they actually gave the answer here when they say state management that is possible through step functions in step functions you will get to create different states and if you want to manage them and we already know step functions has inbuilt error handling and retry logic so obviously why won't you go with that you won't go with the option a the reason because it is not an orchestration tool it has limited orchestration capabilities for jobs that need a specific order so forget about it and you won't use option b because again same thing limited orchestration capabilities for job order and parallel execution so gone and option d you won't use it because data pipeline um, has been deprecated currently and uh, instead you have to use step functions uh, they both has the similar requirements so that's a garden so instead you will pick option c so you, you will pick data brew to process the data and step functions to run data brew data preparation jobs a solutions architect is designing a payment processing application that runs on aws lambda and private subnet across multiple availability zones the application uses multiple lambda functions and processes millions of transactions per each day the architecture must ensure that the application does not process duplicate payments which solution will meet these requirements i i feel like we have seen this somewhere i don't know if it is this or the developer associate exam but we have seen this anyways let's look at the options use lambda to retrieve all due payments okay pretty much all the options are doing that publish the due payments to s three bucket configure the s3 bucket with an event notification to invoke another lambda function to process the due payments you want to invoke another one um how is that going to solve the problem because we already know s3 events are eventually consistent and that might lead to duplicates and again this is again using another lambda function to process due so too much work so let's forget about that option b uses sqs maybe i mean like 
SQS using SQS doesn't mean that it will by default remove deduplication or duplicates. There are instances, I think we have seen a couple of questions where the question says they are using SQS and then there is lambda, they still see duplicates. Why? Right? So using SQS doesn't mean it eliminates duplicates. You have to configure in such a way to make that not happen, but this can still cause uh, duplicates. Option D uses DynamoDB, then configure streams on the DynamoDB table to invoke another one. Uh, complexity, because again, you are trying to integrate DynamoDB and in that again, you are trying to use configure streams on the DynamoDB to invoke another Lambda functions to process the due payments. Okay, so, I mean, at least compared with option C, that is too much operational overhead or administrative overhead. But if you look at this one, all you are doing is using SQS FIFO queue and then you are conferring to FIFO queue. That's it. Here it's the standard queue. The difference is FIFO queue. Why? Because FIFO has actually deduplication capability feature. We have seen this question somewhere. But yeah, it has that. So it will make sure that it won't send the same message again to the Lambda function so that it can avoid the deduplication. A company runs multiple workloads in its on-premises data center. The company's data center cannot scale fast enough to meet the company's expanding business needs. The company wants to collect usage and configuration data about the on-premises servers and workloads to plan a migration to AWS. Okay, so what tool will you use? Definitely it's not DMS or SCT. So you can ignore them. Why? Because we already know DMS and SCT are involved in migrating databases. Okay, it has nothing to do with migrating on-premises servers. Those servers might be databases, but they might be application servers as well. So you cannot use these two in that case. We are left with A and B. Both are using Migration Hub and then they are using Systems Manager and Application Discovery. And for the migrations, to collect usage and configuration data about on-premise servers, that service we use is application discovery service. This service is designed specifically for collecting detailed data about on-premises servers and their dependencies. A company has an organization in AWS organizations that has all features enabled. The company requires that all API calls and logins in any existing or new account must be audited. The company needs a managed solution to prevent additional work and to minimize costs. The company also needs to know when any AWS account is not compliant with foundational security best practices standard. Which solution will meet these requirements with least operational overhead? Least, again, same role we can apply. So let's see which one. Since it's talking about AWS control tower, and least operational, maybe there is a feature for the, did it talk about control tower? No, organizations. So let's see which one of these gives least operational overhead. So let's go through different options. Let's start with bottom up. Uh, looks like these two are using um, the same multi-account landing zone, but here it is using uh, guard duty here it is using security hub so let's learn about these two first and first of all AMS accelerate or AMS accelerate provides a landing zone okay for both of these self-service provision of AWS security hub in this case which covers AWS FSBP and compliance standards but you need to do additional operation steps in order to accomplish that for compliance monitoring and etc. So hence no. And option C which is kind of similar to D. The only thing the difference is here it is using guard duty. And if you know guard duty it is focused on threat detection. It may not cover all aspects of AWS. Foundational security best practices. So you can cancel that as well. So between A and B both are using control tower. And here it says in the organization's management account, here it says dedicated organization's management member account. 
this is member account this is management account obviously if you want to do that where will you do in the management or members account obviously you will do that in the management account not the member account so a will be the correct answer okay so um centralized deployment in the organization management account provides a more efficient way to manage and govern multiple accounts simplifies operations and reduces the overhead of deploying and managing control tower in every account separately hence we will pick that option a company has stored 10 tb of log files in apache parquet format in an s3 bucket the company occasionally needs to use sql to analyze the log files which solution will meet these requirements most cost effectively which one all you have to do is do that create aurora mysql database migrate the data from s3 into aurora by using dms issue sql statements to aurora database do you think this is cost effective no this involves unnecessary data migration and it will result in higher cost and complexity definitely so gone b create redshift cluster then use redshift spectrum to run sql statements directly on data in s3 you do, if you if your use case is to run sql queries on s3 bucket you don't need to create a cluster redshift cluster and spectrum again this introduces overhead of managing the cluster and it might be overkill for occasional sql analysis and it is costly as well and option d it's using emr cluster then run spark sql why in this involves setting up and managing emr cluster which might be more complex and costly than needed for occasional queries on the log so what would you do instead it's very simple to create a glue crawler to store and retrieve table and metadata from s3 bucket then use athena to run sql statement directly on the data in the s3 athena is what it's a serverless right you don't have to set up anything and it doesn't cost money at all not that much only it costs when you query it and a glue crawler can discover and store metadata about the log files and crawler automatically identifies the schema and structure of the data in s3 bucket making it easy to query and then it creates the table which athena uses which is a serverless query service that allows you to run sql queries directly on data in s3 it supports querying data in various formats including parquet got it a company needs a solution to prevent aws cloud formation stacks from deploying iam resources that include an inline policy or star in the statement makes sense the solution must also prohibit deployment of ec2 instances with public ip addresses the company has aws control tower enabled in its organization in aws organization we have seen this question i guess not the exact question but that one involves aws control tower these two are doing the same thing what is the difference okay what is the difference okay here this is proactive controls here detective controls let's look at option a and b which uses these two right but scps Uh, provide a more direct and effective way to control permissions and prevent non-compliance resources instead of using proactive and detective, uh, de detective control. So let's cross these two out. Whenever something about preventing some access to anything using organizations, blindly go with SCP, which is what D is talking about. C is trying to use AWS config rules and system session manager automation. But again, as I said, organizations already has a feature called scp which does it you don't have to use other tools to do the same thing again right scps are used to set fine-grained permissions for entities in organization they allow you to set controls over what actions are allowed or denied across your accounts in this scenario scp can be crafted to deny specific actions related to ec2 instance and im resources and by the way you can we have already we done we have done i think one project or two projects that involved organizations and scps so go check the projects don't forget about it and by the way some of you don't have the patience to sit through this long video instead you only want question and answers which i don't recommend and i won't guarantee that 100 percent pass okay that is up to you but um 
you already know if you are following this series or this channel that after analysis video videos what follows quiz sets and mega quiz sets which i recommend you to use to test your knowledge whatever you learned from watching these videos so it's like a real quiz uh, experience to give real quiz experience i put quiz sets which has 75 questions mega quiz sets 225 questions so those people who don't want to sit uh, you know through these videos you can go ahead and uh, just look at the questions but the answers are provided at the end because i wanted it to be mimicking the real exam but there is that option but i don't recommend it again it's up to you guys but i'm just mentioning they are there okay and by the way if you haven't subscribed please subscribe because 75 percent of the visitors on our channel are not subscribed so think about if they subscribe where will this channel go so i humbly request you guys to subscribe to this channel not just because i said for the content that i already posted and the content that i'm going to post in the coming months as i mentioned i am already working on couple of aws certifications for example like sysops devops and uh, solutions architect professional as well as machine learning security so there are so many awesome things that are coming not just that i am also working on databricks and other certifications as well azure and etc so and this is the number one channel in providing updated questions as soon as they come out so what else you need to subscribe to this channel so go ahead subscribe you can even support the channel by becoming a member and uh, don't forget to hit that like and comment buttons a company's web application that is hosted in aws cloud recently increased in popularity the web application currently exists on a single amazon ec2 instance in a single public subnet the web application has not been able to meet the demand of the increased web traffic the company needs a solution that will provide high availability and scalability to meet the increased user demand without rewriting the web application of course yeah you don't need it which combination of steps will meet these requirements okay so whenever you want it to be scaling high availability and scaling and as you can see there is not much demand right now right so the first option itself says replace the ec2 instance with larger when you don't even have traffic why do you want to increase and whenever it talks about scalability we already know you don't do that instead you will use something called auto scaling right which scales when there is traffic which scales out when there is no traffic obviously so we are going to pick this option for that okay and the second uh, not just that and we want it to be also if you see what are what are they doing right this exists on a single in a single public subnet but usually that's not what we do right we don't expose the web application directly uh, to the public internet instead we we want to put something in front of it obviously right so let's go ahead and see what are the options that will let us do that configure nat gateway in a public subnet to handle you don't do that nat gateway is used for your services to talk to the public internet not the other way around so cancel that and just similar to option a d replace the ec2 instance with larger memory obviously gone so that will leave us with option e which is talking about configure an alv in a public subnet to distribute the web traffic obviously that will be a better option first thing you are not exposing your web application directly to public second thing is you are distributing your traffic between your machines in different availability zones a company has aws lambda functions that use environment variables the company does not want its developer to see environment variables in plain text which solution will meet these requirements okay i don't know what were the reason but let's look at this deploy the code to ec2 instances instead of seriously <laughs> uh, this is this this option is so funny we want to do that does it <laughs> they are literally completely changing that option b configure ssl encryption on lambda functions use cloud hsm to store and encrypt environment variables well while ssl encryption is important for securing data in transit it is not directly related to securing environment variables and cloud hms is not typically used for this purpose so let's cancel that out then you have option c create a certificate in acm configure lambdas to use certificates well 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 
again acm certificates are used for securing data in transit not for encrypting environment variables within lambda functions that will leave us with option d where we are using kms which provides a secure and scalable way to manage keys you can create a customer managed key to encrypt and decrypt environment variables used in lambda functions by enabling encryption helpers on the lambda functions you can have lambda automatically encrypt environment variables using kms keys this ensures that the environment variables are stored and transmitted securely no one can look at them i mean they can look at them but they won't understand it an analytics company uses amazon vpc to run its multi tier services the company wants to use restful apis to offer a web analytics service to millions of users users must be verified by using an authentication service to access the apis which solution will meet these requirements with most operational a efficiency let's look at the options um here if you see what do they want they want authentication service to access the apis for millions of users obviously you are not going to use iam for that because you are not going to set up millions of users in iam right you have to set it up but think of it as like if it is a service like google or something when they are trying to access the api they can sign up themselves you don't have to create it right their user accounts and etc so we are looking for a service something like that not lambda authorizer or iam authorizer you can use lambda functions uh for custom authentication logic but when you have a service called cognito which does this does it for you why do you want to create your own this won't be operational efficiently of efficiency so you can cancel that out now you have a and b both use cognito but one uses user pool another uses identity okay so the difference you can see is right rest api gateway api so this gives more because it's a restful api you don't want to use the http api so for that reason you can immediately cancel this out and we are going to use what cognito user pool for user authentication and then we are going to use rest apis with a cognito authorizer cognito user pools is uh, which prov it is a fully managed service for user identity and authentication that easily scales to millions of users configuring a user pool allows you to handle user authentication efficiently it supports features like multi factor authentication and user management a company has a mobile app for customers the app's data is sensitive and must be encrypted at rest the company uses aws kms the company needs a solution that prevents the accidental deletion of kms keys the solution must use sns to send an email notification to administrators when a user attempts to delete a kms key which solution will meet these with least operational overhead let's go through the options option a uses event bridge to detect when a user tries to delete a kms key and triggers aws config rule to cancel the deletion the config rule is then added as a target for event bridge rule and sns topic is created to notify administrators while it addresses the requirement it involves the configuration of both event bridge and aws config which may introduce additional operational cons um complexity hence let's cross them out option b uh, involves creating a lambda function with custom logic to prevent kms key deletion and uh, using cloudwatch alarms to detect deletion attempts event bridge rule is set up to invoke the lambda function and sns topic is created to notify administrators this while this solution is flexible it requires the maintenance of a custom lambda function introducing additional operational overhead and option c uses event bridge to trigger an aws systems manager automation runbook that cancels the deletion of a kms key and an sns topic is created to notify administrators while this option leverages automation runbooks it introduces again additional complexity compared to other options so that will leave us with option d 
this relies on CloudTrail to capture API events, including the KMS delete key operation. CloudWatch is then used to create a metric filter and an alarm that triggers SNS notifications to administrators. This approach is relatively straightforward and involves fewer components resulting in lower operational overhead. A company wants to analyze and generate reports to track the usage of its mobile app. The app is popular and has a global user base. The company uses a custom report building program to analyze application usage. The program generates multiple reports during the last week of each month. The program takes less than 10 minutes to produce each report. The company rarely uses the program to generate reports outside of the last week of each month. The company wants to generate reports in the least amount of time when the reports are requested, while solution which solution will meet most cost effectively. So they clearly, when they said, they gave two hints to you, 10 minutes, because Lambda has a limit of 15 minutes, so that is one hint. And another hint is rarely uses the program to generate reports, which means they are telling you not to use any EC2 instances. So, uh, something like that, instead they want to use to use serverless, because you will only pay for what you run if you use serverless. So that being said, you can immediately eliminate EC2 instances whenever you have it, wherever you see it. And option B is using Lambda and C is using container service. Okay, again, Lambda, using Lambda is way simpler than uh, running program in ECS because you have to set up ECS and etc. which is little bit operational overhead and even it's little bit costlier than uh, comparing with Lambda function. So we'll go with Lambda. Right, because again, as I said, A and D both have EC2, which may incur additional costs and require managing the life cycle of the instances, potentially leading to higher operational overhead. Whereas option C introduces container orchestration, but may be overkill for the periodic and brief report generation requirements. A company is designing a tightly coupled high performance computing environment in AWS cloud. Company needs to include features that will optimize HPC environment for networking and storage. Which combination of solutions will meet these requirements? Whenever you see HPC in the question, there will definitely be answer Luster. Because Luster file system is designed specifically for HPC environments. So when you see that, obviously you are going to grab it immediately, right? Why won't we? Okay, then we have others that are talking about create an accelerator in global accelerator, configure custom routing for the accelerator. Option A and then C, which is talking about cloud front distribution and then elastic beanstalk. These three are not directly related to optimizing an HPC environment for networking and storage. Global Accelerator, CloudFront, Beanstalk may have their use cases but are not specifically tailored for HPC workloads and their storage or networking. So whenever you see that Luster file system, attach Elastic Fabric Adapter to the instances. Why this? Because EFA enhances networking capabilities providing lower latency communication between instances in a HPC cluster. EFA allows tightly coupled communication between nodes in a HPC cluster, making it suitable for parallel computing workloads. So remember that. Company needs a solution to prevent photos with unwanted content from being uploaded to the company's web application. The solution must not involve training a machine learning model with solution. We have done a similar project in our projects playlist. Um, I haven't uploaded them yet, but I recorded them maybe starting from maybe tomorrow or weekend, we, you will have those. So the last season we did uh, in the projects is as a machine learning engineers. We did, I think about 18 projects as a machine learning engineer. I think a couple of them involves this one, this scenario. So obviously what a tool you are, you are going to use for this, obviously recognition. There is a tool called recognition, which is 
um what do you have how would you say it pre-built ml model you don't have to build any model it is already model built into it which will identify uh, unwanted content along with so many other things just check out that project for more details but yeah we did a project on this one we did so many projects using SageMaker. we did one project using comprehend as well oh there is another recognition uh, so let's go through I forgot about looking at that one okay why are we not choosing D uh, even though it involves recognition uh, recognition video it's talking about video to detect content okay you don't need that you just need recognition there is no uh, need of Amazon recognition video because it's just Amazon recognition it detects both content from both image and videos okay so cross that out as well the option is b a company uses aws to run its e-commerce platform the platform is critical to the company's operations and has a high volume of traffic and transactions the company configures a mfa device to secure its aws account root user credentials company wants to ensure that it will not lose access to the root user account if the msa device is lost which solution will meet these requirements set up a backup administrator account that the company can use to log in if the company loses mfa for root user no this is not a direct solution to the root user this is like you don't do that root user is root user end of story create a new administrator account when the company cannot access no again same thing similar to act a option d says attach the administrative policy again this is these are not direct solutions for root user mfa access problem okay so what would you do you will add multiple mfa devices for the root user account to handle the disaster scenario right see something like high availability redundance same thing with this multiple mfa devices that's all a solution a social media company is creating a rewards program website for its users the company gives users points when users create and upload photos to the website users redeem their points for gifts or discounts from companies affiliated partners a unique id identifies users partners refer to this id to verify user eligibility for rewards the partners want to receive notification of user ids through an http endpoint when the company gives users points hundreds of vendors are interested in becoming affiliated partners every day the company wants to design an architecture that gives the website the ability to add partners rapidly in a scalable way which solution will meet these requirements with the least implementation effort though this is the first time i am seeing least implementation effort. create amazon time stream database to keep a list of affiliated partners implement lambda function to read the list configure the lambda function to send user ids to each partner when the company gives user points time stream database is a purpose built time series database and might not be an unnecessary might be an unnecessary complexity for this use case step functions option c is using step functions which introduces additional complexity and may not be as straightforward for partners to integrate we are not looking for something like that and option d is using data streams which requires managing producer consumer application adding complexity compared to the simplicity of sns for the notification scenario so let's create a sns topic then choose endpoint protocol subscribe the partners to the topic publish user id is simple all they need is something notifications right notification notification service and the final question for this video and for this month is an e-commerce company runs its application on aws the application uses an aurora postgresql cluster in multi az mode for the underlying database during a recent promotion campaign the application experienced heavy read and write workload users experienced timeout issues when they attempted to access the application solutions architect needs to make the application architecture more scalable and highly available which solution will meet these requirements with least downtime 
okay they attempted to access the application okay so which one should we use experience the timeout issues whenever you see timeout issues connection issues what did i tell you in one of the question go with proxy whichever option mentions proxy go ahead blindly pick it which is option c but let's go through this one as well this one is using event bridge and lambda for logging state change events uh, this is more about observability and event handling rather than directly addressing scalability and availability concerns. Option B, zero downtime restart, Z, ZDR, ZDR feature in Aurora helps with minimizing downtime during planned maintenance rather than addressing the ongoing heavy load and timeout issues. Option D, we are going to use DMS. We, we do know when we use DMS, right? But again, this option is adding elastic cache for Redis with DMS, which introduces complexity and may not be the most straightforward solution for improving the scalability and availability of the Aurora cluster. So in order to do for you to achieve that, what should you do? You add additional reader instances to the Aurora cluster. Then you will create RDS proxy target group for a Aurora cluster. So scalability, adding additional re reader instances to Aurora cluster allows for horizontal scaling of read capacity, which addresses the heavy read load. And by using, um, hold on a minute, yeah. By using RDS proxy helps manage database connections, improving application scalability and reducing downtime during failovers. So that's about it from my end. I know this is a long video, so I have spent enough time. So it is your time now. Exit from full screen, hit that like, comment, subscribe and become a member to support this channel. Thank you very much for your time here and all the best. Don't forget to um, post your results in the exam if you are writing one before the next month. Okay. And don't forget after this video, you will see uh, a mega quiz set, which will come, I think, which will include, if I, I already didn't post, then you will see one, which will include, I think, about 200 hours of questions. I don't know. I have to check that. But don't go anywhere. Enable notifications to get notified about all this awesome stuff. Got it? And thank you very much. Have a great day. See you in the next video. Peace out.